Hello and welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service coming to you live from London. I'm Paul Henley. In a moment, we'll look at Donald Trump's speech to the Republican convention. Can it reach beyond Republican voters to the wider electorate? And later in the program, Lee Doucette in Baghdad is in the grip of a heat wave, which is good news for some. Fans, air conditioners, air coolers, you're keeping all, cool. All, 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 all. <laughs> How do you keep cool in Baghdad? It's Yesterday was 51 degrees. Yes, hot. Very, very hot. Are you hoping, are you looking forward to September when it will be less hot? We prefer the temperature. We are businessmen. We want to sell. Yes. <laughs> ah, so it's a very good business to be an air yeah, conditioning yeah, man. It is on this, yes. <laughs> That's coming up a bit later. Now, traditionally, the new Republican candidate's first official speech as presidential hopeful is a moment for reaching out to voters who aren't natural supporters. But no one really expects Donald Trump to follow tradition. James Kumarasamy reports now from Cleveland, Ohio, on a forceful speech from Donald Trump introduced by his eldest daughter, Ivanka. I have loved and respected him my entire life, and I could not be more proud tonight to present to you and to all of America my father and our next president, Donald J. Trump. All week it had been a family affair, and it was Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka, who introduced her father to the crowd. He strode on stage against a computerised backdrop of virtual American flags and began with some uncharacteristic humility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Friends, delegates and fellow Americans, I humbly and gratefully accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. But it wasn't long before he was painting a picture of a nation in decline and under threat from urban shootings, Islamic terrorism and uncontrolled immigration. Nearly 180,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records ordered deported from our country are tonight roaming free to threaten peaceful citizens. The crowd responded by chanting, build a wall. Donald Trump's message to the country, I'm the only person who can keep America safe. In this race for the White House, I am the law and order candidate. And who was responsible for a country that's on the edge? You can probably guess. America is far less safe, and the world is far less stable than when Obama made the decision to put Hillary Clinton in charge of America's foreign policy. But as the crowd shouted, lock her up, he proposed a more democratic way of removing Hillary Clinton from the political seat. Let's defeat her in November. A defeat for her, he said, would be a defeat for someone in the pocket of corporate America. They are throwing money at her because they have total control over every single thing she does. She is their puppet, and they pull the strings. Mr Trump blamed Bill Clinton for signing NAFTA, which he called one of the worst economic deals of all time, and he blamed China for currency manipulation. You want jobs and wealth, he said, count on me. I am going to bring back our jobs to Ohio and Pennsylvania and New York and Michigan and all of America, and I am not going to let companies move to other countries firing their employees along the way without consequence. Not going to happen anymore. So, did he sound presidential? Well, the delivery was typically Trump, but he was trying to broaden his appeal beyond the Republicans, referring to the deaths of African Americans in cities and to the threats facing the LGBTQ community. Overall, though, it was less of a carefully crafted narrative than a list of relentlessly threatening problems. 
that only he, Donald Trump, could fix. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. That was Donald Trump in Cleveland. So was the speech the hit it sounded with the party faithful? And did Mr Trump do enough to win over wavering Conservatives? After all, many senior Republicans, including the entire Bush family, decided to steer clear of the convention altogether, and Trump's closest primary rival, Ted Cruz, has very publicly refused to endorse him. Brad Blakeman served as a senior advisor to President George W. Bush during his time in the White House. He's now a professor of public policy, politics and international affairs at Georgetown University in Washington. I put it to him that Donald Trump was big on identifying problems, but light on offering solutions. He was, but that's generally what you get out of an acceptance speech. It's a broad brush. And now in the next hundred plus days, he's going to put some meat on the bone and tell us exactly how he's going to accomplish what he set forth in his acceptance speech. Isn't it conventional at this point in the campaign to reach out to those voters who might not be automatically drawn to him, to be more inclusive? Yeah, and I think he did that last night. He talked, again, about the problems in America, in the black communities, with Latinos, with immigration. He talked about the LBGTQ community. So I think Donald Trump, if you listen very closely to what he's saying, is inclusive of every American. He will need Hispanic votes. He didn't talk about that particularly last night, apart from mentioning the famous wall. Well, you know, uh, Hispanics that are legally in America want the same things every other American does, and they don't want people taking their jobs. They came here legally, and they expect the same thing. Obviously, you're feeling his momentum at this stage. Can that momentum continue and indeed go all the way? Yes, absolutely. This is the year of the outsider in American politics. Everybody counted Donald Trump out, including me. He was not my first choice. He wasn't even my second choice. But he is my choice. And his biggest strength is the ability to be underestimated. I think the American people are looking for other types of leadership from people who don't necessarily need to be president or who want to be president, but who feel that it's time to have fresh eyes look at America's problems. Let's be specific for a moment. Which states will he swing to majority Republican support? to get to that crucial 270 number that he needs to take the presidency? Well, you know, there are a couple of key states that we must win. That's Florida and Ohio. But we're looking at states that even weren't in play four years ago. Pennsylvania is very much within reach. There are probably only about eight states that are really going to be in play this year. Florida, Ohio, Virginia, Colorado, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And I think that's where his running mate, Mike Pence, can be of great help because Mike Pence is from the state of Indiana, which, of course, is in the Rust Belt, where Donald Trump has really caught on. And that's, of course, the neighbor of the important state of Ohio. He seemed to indicate that he thought that America would instantly be a safer place. Indeed, that there would be a huge reduction in crime the moment he became president, if that happened. That would be an easy one to disprove, wouldn't it? Well, you know, again, politics is about rhetoric but it's also about putting that rhetoric into application. Leadership goes a long way in turning around problems. We saw it when Ronald Reagan became president. Ronald Reagan had the hostages released from Iran on the day he was inaugurated. He didn't have one meeting. He didn't go to the U.N., but the projection of strength and leadership was enough to have the Iranians say, we better do the right thing. Do we have the necessary unified Republican Party now, do you think? Yes, I think we have enough of it. Uh, There are still some people who need to be convinced. But I think if you saw the reaction of that hall last night, there is no doubt that people are behind Donald Trump. Your former boss, George W. Bush, chose to stay away. Does that bother you? Yeah, it does. I'm disappointed, and I've said that publicly. Um, You you know, you dance with the person who brought you to the dance. And uh, um, I hope that he'll come around in the next few weeks. But, um, you know, the fact is that a lot of the people who stayed away, quite frankly, were not even missed. That was Brad Blakeman, who's a politics professor and Republican supporter. 
And the time is 16 minutes past the hour. The French president, François Hollande, has said his country will step up its military support for the Iraqi government forces fighting the group calling itself Islamic State. His announcement was partly a response to last month's lorry attack in Nice, after which Islamic State called the driver who killed 84 people one of its soldiers. We can talk now live to Hugh Schofield in Paris. Welcome, Hugh. How significant is this? Well, obviously it's significant in in that the bulk of French effort in in, uh, in the Middle East against IS has been from the air, of course. Up till now, it's been taking part in the in the in the raids in Iraq and in Syria, uh, and this is a ratcheting up. I mean, it's calibrated. Uh, you know, still there's no question of of troops on the ground, and that's you know remains a big taboo in France as it does in Britain and America. But um, the fact of sending batteries of artillery which is what they're talking about we don't know how many um is you know a, a, an escalation a sign that there is still continuing huge pressure on the french government to be seen to be doing something uh, against the islamic state more than just the bombing the, these batteries will be out next month they'll be accompanied by what i've termed here Advisors. It's not entirely clear whether they'll be actually manning the batteries or just um, advising uh, Iraqi forces on how to uh, operate them. And it, I, I suppose it's, it's uh, significant that this comes just as the Iraqi armies and the Iraqi forces are are, are talking of um, launching this offensive against Mosul. It may be that you know the idea is that they take part in that. He said he had confidence in his Minister of the Interior. What does that mean to those who aren't in the know? Well, I mean, there's, there's been a big row here over Bernard Cazeneuve and what he did or didn't know about the security arrangements in Nice. I mean, it, this, is, this may sound more trivial than it, it, than it, than it need be, or, or I should say it probably is more trivial than it, it's been turned into. Um, but it's quite a big row, nonetheless. There, there, there is, um, on the night of the Nice attack... It's not clear how many police there were in place, where they were, what level of police they were. The, the government, Bernard Cazeneuve, has put out one version of events. There, there is evidence and allegations that the level of policing at, at the scene was not what he said it was, and that, uh, in a sense, he's trying to sort of cover himself up by p- pretending or claiming that the level of coverage was, was, was greater than it was. I don't think anyone is suggesting that had there been more police with better arms, this could have been avoided. I think the allegation is more that... There hasn't been complete honesty about the the, the 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 police force that were there thank you very much hugh schofield in paris you're listening to the bbc world service this is news hour coming up a new exhibition devoted to the art of the prosthetic limb and the face prostheses are objects that are so incredibly sculptural They extend, they exceed, they enhance the body. And what's really interesting, the processes of making them are just the same as it is in a figurative sculptor's studio. A reminder of our main news headlines. The French president, François Hollande, has announced an increase in military support to fight the Islamic State group in Iraq. The two-and-a-half-year-long search for Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 will be suspended if the plane is not found in the current search area. And new data suggests there's been a dramatic deterioration in economic activity in the UK since the referendum decision to leave the EU. This is Paul Henley with NewsHour, live from the BBC in London. Now, for several months, militants in southeastern Nigeria have been bombing oil pipelines. The violence has slashed the country's oil production by a third. The militants are furious at the government's decision to reduce payments to former fighters. Our correspondent Martin Patience visited the Niger Delta, where he spoke exclusively to a militant commander. We're on a speedboat snaking our way through the creeks of the Niger Delta. The wash from the boat is lapping up against the mangroves. It's a beautiful place, but outsiders are no longer welcome. The militants are back in business here, attacking pipelines and installations, bringing chaos to the creeks. We're just pulling up at a pier in the village of Karuti. I don't drink, sir, but you're offering me some gin. 
Is this the custom here when you this arrive is, in the chairman of your community? Uh, the traditional thing here, when we get when you get to the Baramatu Kingdom, you are properly entertained. Chief Dan is a local leader, and he says the oil industry has been a curse to his community. The occupation of our people here is largely fishing, but our ecosystem is degraded. The aquatic life is destroyed because of oil exploration. That is the quagmire where we find ourselves. We don't have job. That is the cry of the people of the Niger Delta. We're here to visit the campus of the Delta's first maritime university. It's ready to open. There are a dozen buildings, including a lecture hall, dormitories, and even this. I'm standing at the bottom of a 10-metre diving tank, and directly above me is a rickety roof, and I'm surrounded by blue tiles. And this tank was supposed to be the centrepiece of the university. It was where former militants could learn a new set of skills, such as welding underwater or carrying out rescue missions. But instead, it stands here empty, a symbol of what locals say is broken promises by the central government. Uh, we feel seriously neglected that for the first time, the federal government established an institution like this in this place, and then turning around to say that uh, they will not go ahead, ahead with the project. And it's this anger that's fueling the latest militancy. The government's announced it's cutting the budget to pay tens of thousands of ex-fighters by 70%. The monthly payments were part of an amnesty programme agreed seven years ago, which ended the last period of serious violence. One militant commander agreed to speak to us. He didn't want to be named. You're back in the Niger Delta today carrying out attacks. We are back to the creek. On what attacks have you carried out? A lot. On pipelines? Yes. Pipelines, on platform, on stations, a lot. But these are criminal acts. Sometimes people get killed and the government considers you a terrorist. We, we, we are non terrorists. We always demanding for our rights. We have been slaves for so many years. We are not fighting it for selfish purpose. We are doing it so that our communities will be developed. If the government doesn't reach an agreement with groups like yours, yeah. what do you think will happen? Things will be getting worse now. Back in the creeks, Chief Dan is showing me around a local palace. A Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is uh, what our people call the supreme deity of Igbesu. It would have been once beautiful, but it's now in ruins. It was bombed... Manager military in 2009. How do you feel just seeing this palace in ruins? Why hasn't it well, been rebuilt? Yeah, we, we would have rebuilt it long ago, but we felt that this thing should serve as a monument, how the government destroyed the people of Guantanamo. Few here are willing to forget the past. Old conflicts are being fought once again in the Delta, and that's reopening Nigeria's deep divisions. Martin Patience there reporting from Nigeria. Now, a British parliamentary committee says the government should reconsider its strategy for fighting extremism because it risks making the situation worse. The Joint Committee on Human Rights says a proposed clampdown on religious conservatives could drive wedges through communities. It warns that planned legisl legislation could undermine the support of British Muslims, which it describes as the most precious asset in the fight against terrorism. With me in the studio is Rashad Ali, who's resident senior fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, which is a London-based think tank specialising in anti-extremism work. Welcome, Rashad. Do you agree that the government's, the government's strategy could make things worse? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I think it's yet to see how it unfolds, but I think the problems with it are that essentially it gets in the way of the broader counterterrorism strategy. One of the aspects of the broader counterterrorism strategy is to undermine the ideology and challenge extremist ideology. In order to do that, you need to be able to debate it and bring it out into the public space. So that means you need to keep all the Muslim community on board with the debate, right? Well, I think what it means is that you need to have extremist voices that can be challenged. What this bill tries to do is actually shut them down. So some of the measures are things like you know, banning them from speaking in public, 
uh, what they call behavioural orders where they're not allowed to actually go out and engage in public activities. So this means that we can't actually challenge the ideology. And I think in that sense, the broader counterterrorism strategy, one of its strands is challenging the ideology and making sure that those voices that do present it are essentially, you know, we can build our values out from there rather than merely shut them down. How far do you go? How extremist is a statement before it should be stopped from being heard in public? Well, I think this is the problem with defining extremism. One of the things that the report explains is that there is no singular definition that everyone has a consensus on. And whilst it's easy to say, you know, terrorism is fairly easy, even though that's quite disputed, to say, well, actually, inciting someone into doing a violent act very clearly crosses the red line. There are also things, like you mentioned, religious conservatism. I mean, I'm mentioning uh, Tim Farron as an example of someone who has certain religious beliefs. And he's the head of the Liberal Democrats. I mean, he has certain beliefs about homosexuality. No one would accuse him of being an extremist. But actually what this tries to do is there's a gap between religious conservatism and terrorism. And that's where you have organisations and groups which, for example, will say the role of government is to enforce strict morality. It's to say, actually, if you are an adulterer, you should be stoned to death. If you are homosexual, you should be executed. Now, that's not actually technically illegal. You know, to make that, you know, to campaign for that ideology isn't technically illegal. But you have to hear that in public in order for such views to be criticised. I think the, the problem is that at the moment, if we step back, and the reason for the government bringing this out is that civil society has failed to challenge these ideas. Look, moderate Muslims are affected by the social fallout of extremism, you know, in, in, that, in that people are, are criticised for beliefs which are nothing to do with them. Wouldn't some of them be glad of a clampdown on those who are propagating extreme conservative beliefs? I think to some extent, yes, I think some people would, you know, in the community be happy that these ideas are being trampled upon. So I don't see this as being anti-Muslim in that sense. But the problem with it is actually we're a liberal society, which in the definition of extremism, there's this idea of believing in basic freedom of belief, respect for religious differences, and actually very fundamentally the rule of law. And what the rule of law actually means is that we don't unjustly stop people from expressing their opinion, no matter how obnoxious. Rashad Ali from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Many thanks for coming on the programme. And uh, a reminder that you can hear this programme twice a day and uh, you can listen whenever you like as well because we've got two editions and you can find the latest online at bbcworldservice.com. Better still, sign up for our free download. Just search for BBC NewsHour podcast. This is NewsHour from the World Service. I'm Paul Henley. We're live from London. Coming up next, the search for Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 will be suspended if the plane isn't found in the current search area. First, our daily look at the world of business and the world's last manufacturer of video cassette recorders is about to end production. Funai Electric, which is Japanese with a factory in China, once had annual global sales of 15 million VCRs. The VHS format revolutionised home entertainment in the 1970s and 80s, marking the end of having to stay in to watch a particular TV programme or miss it forever. But of course, technology has moved on and even subsequent DVDs have been more or less replaced by online streaming. Tim Roby, a film critic with The Telegraph newspaper here in the UK, told me about how he remembered the VCR. There is a lot of nostalgia attached to that because it's the way I grew up experiencing films, really, like a lot of people in my generation, collecting them through, you know, the late 80s and 90s, building up a library. And also, I miss the days of rental from the, from the news agents, you know, popping down twice a week, to see what they had in. That's really the way I kind of explored films when I was that age. They made a massive difference to TV viewing as well, didn't they? They absolutely did. You know, you would set your recorder for whatever was coming on, say, you know, late night BBC Two or Channel 4 back in the days when they actually used to sort of program quite interesting films in those, in those night owl slots. I feel as though that's, that's fallen away now because everything's digitised, so everything's just kind of more readily available, and yet somehow something has been lost, I think. In a way, you could say that the VCR was the, the beginning of the end of a golden age, wasn't it, when a whole nation was round the television to watch a particular programme and it was a subject of conversation at work the next day and so on. When, once you could record that programme, it, it faded that. Yeah, there is a point there, actually. I think in, particularly, though, in terms of film viewing, as VHS caught on and the, um, the film companies put more and more out on, 
on video. It was just an opportunity to see films that you would rarely otherwise get to see. And obviously now DVD has taken over from that and subsequently Blu-ray and obviously streaming and all of these things. But there's something about the old VHS that it does, does kind of pang at you a little bit. And there are a lot of film societies these days which do like to actually put on screenings of films from VHS just because of that kind of slight association that you have back to watching things back in that era. There's something about the format. It's a little bit like thinking about celluloid, something about the fact that it's being played through a tape which can fail. There's something fragile about it. The image can break up and having to fiddle with the tracking back in those days. People kind of, I think, attach a bit more value to that, that, that sort of format than the kind of wipe clean digital formats we have. But of course, technically, they have no advantages, video cassettes, do they? They've simply been superseded by technology. That's absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's no comparison between VHS picture and, and what Blu-ray can give you, for instance. And even the, the, the celluloid comparison doesn't work because VHS was really such a primitive format. It really broke down film into such a low resolution that we've now become much more accustomed to watching films in, in better quality. The funny thing is, though, I don't know about you, but for me and most of the people in my generation, this is the way that we watched most of our films, and we were perfectly happy with it at the time. It's only now that we've had the opportunity to see them in these, in these better formats that we now would register a VHS image with shock, actually. We would think, oh, my God, we used to put up with that. That was the Telegraph film critic Tim Roby on the demise of the video tape recorder. You're listening to News Hour from the BBC. I'm Paul Henley. It's been more than two years now since Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared from radar screens on its way from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. And hope is fading of ever finding out what happened to the 239 people who were on board. By the time authorities started taking seriously satellite information that the flight had veered off into the Indian Ocean, black box locator beacons were running out of battery. Today, the Australian, Malaysian and Chinese authorities all confirmed that they will suspend their scans of the seabed once their current search area has been fully probed. I've been talking to Tony Cable, an air accident investigator for AFTER Limited. He was previously based at the UK Air Accident Investigation Branch at Farnborough. I know there's been a prediction recently by an oceanographer looking at the bits and pieces that have been found around the Madagascar area and uh, he's suggesting the search area may be somewhat north of the designated search area. Based on what? Well, on the drift of the wreckage. For it to get where it's been found, it's got there because it's been moved by the wind and the current. He's crunched the numbers and come up with this... uh, I don't think it's very definite, but he's come up with a suggestion that the impact area, or the wreckage area anyway could be um, somewhat north of the designated search area. A Dutch company involved in the search said yesterday that it thought the plane could have travelled further than currently thought. Uh, That theory is reliant on either a suicidal pilot, isn't it, or a hijacking? I mean, yes, certainly an aircraft can glide a long distance from cruise altitude, either because it's being manually piloted or possibly under autopilot. I imagine the search area has been designated with that firmly in mind. As things stand, Tony, we can only speculate. What is your speculation for what it's worth on what happened to MH370? I would only speculate about what appear to be the plausible scenarios based on what is known, which is not a great deal. And those clearly are hostile action by passengers' crew or whatever, or a systems problem that... um, maybe incapacitates the crew and the aircraft just carries on on autopilot after the crew has started to attempt a diversion or something like that. So for now at least the mystery remains unsolved. Those are the thoughts of veteran aircraft engineering accident investigator Tony Cable. Let's pick up on one of those theories that the plane disappeared because someone in the cockpit wanted it to. That could mean hijacking or, as we saw with last year's German Wings crash, a crew member deliberately bringing the plane down. In a rare interview, the BBC's transport correspondent, Richard Westcott, has spoken to Sakinab Shah. Her brother, Zakare, was the chief pilot on board MH370 and despite there being no evidence, some still suspect him of deliberately crashing the plane. How did that make her feel? Oh, that was very hurtful. You know, added to the stress of the loss, a very close brother of mine is missing. 
And on top of that, I have to contend with all the accusations. It's a very, very difficult, very tricky situation. I cry oftentimes. We all, we all do, my siblings and I, my nieces are affected because they were so close to this uncle. The last time uh, I met up with him was about two weeks prior to his flight. We went out for dinner. At that time, he was, he was his normal self. That's why it's, it's just incredible that with all the accusations coming his way, I find it... I find it hard to accept. Was there any moment where you had the slightest doubt, where you sort of thought, well, did I miss something? You know, perhaps he was depressed and I didn't realise. Uh, like about a week after it disappeared, all of us gathered, even my sister from overseas came back. We gathered in Penang. We had our brainstorming session. There was not a moment when we doubted our brother. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing that we could think of that would make us doubt if he indeed was turning rogue. Maybe I should even tell you that the career that he was having is one of his childhood dream. Right from a very young age, he's recorded 18,000 plus hours of flying time. No bad record, nothing untoward, nothing happened all those times. It was just a few years before retirement. Do you think he would want to throw all this down the drain? That was Sakinab Shah. Her brother, Zakare, was the chief pilot on board flight MH370. France and Spain have been hit by record temperatures as a heat wave continues to scorch Western Europe. In recent days, as temperatures have risen into the 30s in Celsius, the hashtag heat wave has been trending in Britain and there have been a fair few people saying they can't cope. There's officially a heat wave at the moment in much of central and eastern US with temperatures of about 38 degrees. Spare a thought then for people in Iraq where temperatures have peaked above 50 Celsius in the capital Baghdad. Lise Doucette went out onto the streets armed with sun cream to uh, find out how people attempted to beat the heat. I've come to the place that's the key to keeping cool. This is the street that sells air conditioners, air coolers, fans, generators. It's almost all they sell up and down this street. Every shape and size for Iraqis rich and poor. Hello? Hello? Hello. Are you brothers? Your brothers? Yes, the brothers. Yeah, brothers. And what's your name? Qasim. Qasim and... Abbas. Abbas, you really look alike. And you've got fans, air conditioners, air coolers. You're keeping all, cool. All, 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 all. <laughs> How do you keep cool in Baghdad? It's Yesterday was 51 degrees. Yes, it was. Very, very hot. In, in Britain, it was 36 degrees. And people found it really difficult. What do you say to them? That's like winter, 36 yes, degrees. Yes, yes, Iraq. Are you hoping, you looking forward to September when it will be less hot? We prefer the temperature. We are businessmen. We want to sell. Yes. <laughs> Ah, so it's a very good business to be an air conditioning yeah, man. It is on this, yes. <laughs> You're making good money. Yes, good money. <laughs> yes. Wow, what a fabulous ice cream shop this is. There's half a dozen young men serving up sweet ice cream in scoops, all kinds of chocolate and lemon, mint green, orange, vanilla... These men are eating delicious looking ice cream. Hello. Hello. How How's the ice cream? Yes, it's good. Yes. yes. Mm. It's, what kind is it? The milk. Milk. It looks with green the... with some nuts. Yes. It's hot in Baghdad. Of course. It's 50 and degrees. Do you find eating ice cream helps? No. <laughs> Nothing helps. It's too hot. In Britain, it's been, they talk about a heat wave. It's 36 degrees. They say it's too hot. 36 too hot? Let him try here. What I say? Try live here. One week. No, too much one week. One day. One day is enough. Then there's the public spaces like this popular park. Just listen to the children on the creaky swings. Traditionally in Baghdad, as the 
sun drops and the temperatures ease. It should be about 36 degrees now. Iraqi families, young people come to places like this. There aren't as many as usual, and that's because the terrible bombing in Baghdad a few weeks ago, which killed nearly 300 people, happened a short distance away. But people still come out, because whether it's the weather or the war, Iraqis find ways to carry on. That's what life is like here. Set reporting from the heat of Baghdad. Our discussion programme, News Hour Extra, comes from Turkey this week. Owen Bennett Jones asked his guests in Istanbul what happens next for the country after the failed coup there. His very lively panel of guests include an, an activist in the ruling AK party as well as a supporter of Fethullah Gulen, the man accused of being behind the coup plot. Here's a flavour of that discussion. First, Ismail Sezgin, the Gulenist, denying the involvement of Gulen supporters in the coup. And after that, Yavuz Yigit, who's the activist for President Erdogan's AK party, responds with Owen trying his best to moderate. There hasn't been any single case that, you know, like that I heard of that Gulen was charged or a Gulenist was charged of misusing his powers in favour of Gulen. Well, it, it, let me put it to you that okay. really almost without exception, people living in Turkey yes. think he was involved. OK, and so as billions of people think that Santa Claus exists as well. And I'm asking, where is the evidence that would open my eye? Because, you know, like, is there a problem with judges or law books or... OK, well, I, I think it's time to go to Yavuz get Absolutely. And the answer for the Ismail, he's saying, oh, did you go to the judiciary system? Judiciary system, you own it. You own the judiciary system too. You sent the people to the prison for life, OK? So it's like talking about this Gulenist people, uh, what I call terrorists. They're not just one party ruling the army uh, and also the police and also the judiciary system. So uh, Ismail, now is the time for you to come back on these okay. various points. I mean, basically, there is a widespread agreement that the Gulenists do indeed command loyalties that are not strictly to the institutions they serve, but are to Mr Gulen. That is the basic point. And it, I, mean, I don't think any it's a question of legal cases or anything else. Do you accept that is true? I don't think Gulen has that much influence in the power. I don't think he can't pull something that... I don't think it, there is nothing to gain for him. Even if he comes to power, he loses all the world. And if he loses, he loses everything. I he's don't think lose. in that sense. This is my opinion, of course. He's going to lose all of it. And you also going to lose. It. Ismail's... Oh, is it as a threat on life? Yavuz, that's mine. Yavuz, that's fine. That's a, we that's are trying a, to have a conversation very nice here. We'll and think uh, again after Yavuz's comment. I'll have to look out for myself now. Yeah, you should do. You're a, you're, you're a part of a terrorist organization, oh so you need to be Oh, my God, what is your uh, evidence? You, you know, what is yeah. your evidence? Why, yeah. Should I be asking a, a security guard or something? Okay, what, what go is this? to the court. We can debate on the court. So just... What, with you? Uh, why, don't you why don't you just sue me? What is it? Okay. You have okay. all okay. the judges' gonna, things. I, I think this dialogue shows I, I, everything that is wrong about Turkey at the moment. <laughs> OK, That's Ismail, can you... Uh, th th Ismail Sejgin, thank you very I'm much. I'm ashamed thank of you. this. Thank you for coming on. Oh, oh, my God. I mean, what I can say is that what we're actually seeing is a tug-of-war between two movements of a power struggle. And I'm trying to find a silver lining coming out of this coup, but my optimist side is getting weaker and weaker. If this kind of dialogue between uh, these two powers continue... I don't think there would be enough space of air for any democratic discussion or uh, any democratic rights, really. That was a flavour of this week's feisty news hour extra, and the last exasperated voice you heard was Turkish journalist Ezgi Basharan. You can listen to the full programme on air on the World Service over the weekend or by going to the News Hour Extra website and downloading the programme from there. Right now, you're listening to the BBC World Service and News Hour. Here's a reminder of our top story this hour. Accepting the Republican presidential nomination, Donald Trump has said he would end the crime and violence that affect America today. Earlier in the programme, Brad Blakeman, a former senior staffer in the George W. Bush White House, told me that his party's nominee could win the election. Everybody counted Donald Trump out, including me. 
He was not my first choice. He wasn't even my second choice. But he is my choice. I think the American people are looking for other types of leadership from people who don't necessarily need to be president or who want to be president but who feel that it's time to have fresh eyes look at America's problems. Two other main headlines. The French president has announced an increase in military support to fight the Islamic State group in Iraq. And the two-and-a-half-year-long search for Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 will be suspended if the plane is not found in the current search area. This is Paul Henley with NewsHour from the BBC World Service. Most of us probably tend to think of prosthetic limbs as functional, but a new exhibition in the UK is exploring the links between medical science and sculpture. It's called The Body Extended. It's celebrating artificial additions to the human body as potential art, and it is hosted by the Henry Moore Institute in the city of Leeds. Earlier I spoke to its curator, Lisa Lefeuve. We've been thinking at the Henry Moore Institute for a long time about how we can address figurative sculpture, the human body and technology. And the more we thought about it, we really started to understand that prostheses are objects that are so incredibly sculptural. They extend, they exceed, they enhance the body. And what's really interesting, the processes of making them are just the same as it is in a figurative sculptor's studio. Have they always been like that? I'm I'm sure it was a big leap for the soldiers of the First World War to see their prosthetic limbs as works of art, for instance. Completely. And this debate around prostheses is really at the root of their definition. They need to be functional, but they also need to be formal. We care about what we look like. So the First World War, of course, was a terrible event. And the facts of technology are that technological developments are at their most rapid in times of war. And the nature of trench warfare meant that facial disfigurement was a new problem for medics to solve. And this incredible sculptor, Francis Derwent Wood, began making facial prostheses, masks that he felt that as a sculptor, he had particular skills where he could understand the body and also really think about the aesthetic properties. I suppose one aim was to make sure that the faces of injured soldiers, once they were half covered in a mask, were not scary. That's completely it. And there were a lot of reports, really, really heartbreaking, where children might see their father and be frightened. But, of course, this opens a whole debate. Should these kinds of injuries be hidden? Should they not be hidden? But yet it gave soldiers that confidence to have a public life. And this working together of a sculptor and the medical profession was really central. So on the one hand, you have this very practical way of thinking about sculpture and prostheses. But other artists looked at this new machine human, this technologized body, and thought about a dystopian future. And we can even see it today. So in movies like Metropolis, that fear of the technologised body. And your exhibition consists of historical objects, but also newly commissioned ones, such as... We've got this really amazing sculpture by the British artist Rebecca Warren that stands tall outside of our building. A pair of monumental legs rise up. They're bronze, they're purposeful... And they stand on a trolley with casters. So you really have this sense that these legs could spring into action. I worry a little bit about the ability to offend, maybe to patronise, when you say to somebody wearing a prosthetic limb, I think that's beautiful. I am going to completely disagree with you. I think that sense of the beauty of technology, the material choices that are made with a prosthetic, are absolutely crucial. I think what's essential when we think about prostheses is they're not stand-ins, they're not supplements, rather they are additions that create possibilities for a body. So we really want to argue in this exhibition, look at all the different bodies that we can have and prostheses 
are a factual part of the body. And yes, they are beautiful. Lisa Lefeuve in Leeds. More proof is emerging that drinking alcohol causes cancer directly. Researchers in New Zealand have suggested alcohol triggers nearly 6% of cancer deaths worldwide. The highest risks are from heavy drinking, but even people who drink a little are in danger. Here's Professor Jenny Connor from Otago University in New Zealand, which led the research. What the evidence suggests is that there's no threshold. So although we're familiar with the idea of drinking guidelines, keeping us at a safe level of drinking... Any amount of alcohol appears to increase your risk somewhat. Obviously, the highest risks are associated with the heaviest drinking, and there's a gradient of risk. So the less you drink, the lower that extra risk is. But there isn't a level at which you can feel confident that your drinking is not contributing to your risk of cancer. So how much are people aware of this relationship between alcohol and cancer? I spoke to Sarah Williams, Health Information Manager at Cancer Research UK. I think this news today actually might be quite surprising to a lot of people. A study that Cancer Research UK actually carried out a few months ago showed that about 9 in 10 people in the UK aren't aware at all that alcohol um, can cause cancer. Really? They don't think there's any link? According to our research, um, it's actually pretty rare for people to be aware that there is a link between alcohol and cancer, which is, of course, very worrying because we know that in the UK, alcohol causes about 12,800 cases of the disease every year. Some of these types of cancer might be things that um, you know people might sort of logically expect to be the case. So people might often think that liver cancer is, is linked with alcohol, but it isn't just liver cancer. There's things like mouth cancer, but also breast and bowel cancers as well. And there's some of the more common cancers. And they do actually have quite a large number of cases caused by alcohol. Right, so if you're pouring a glass of wine for yourself of an evening, you've got to weigh up how much do I want this wine against how much do I want to expose myself to the risk of cancer. Drinking does seem to be one of those things which actually we, we can do quite a lot out of habit without really thinking about it. So um, perhaps reaching for a glass of wine when you get home from work or automatically ordering a pint um, when someone asks what you want to drink in the pub. And it's those little things where actually the amount you drink might be surprising to some people. So one of the things that we would recommend people do is try and track your drinking for a week or so. And you actually might be surprised to find your drinking rather more than you thought. And then there are also lots of easier ways that we, we can help ourselves to cut down partly by trying to interfere with sort of the habits, the automatic reaching for a glass of alcohol that we haven't really decided that we want. So things like not keeping cold drinks, so white wine or beer, not keeping those in the fridge. So you have to kind of have planned that I want to have this drink and, and, and taken some action to have it. And also things like not getting into big rounds if you're out with friends so that you can stay in control of your own drinking and kind of not be led along by everybody else. There are many other questions still for research to answer, aren't there? The biological reasons for the link are still far from clear. We have some good clues about how alcohol could be causing these different types of cancer in our bodies. So, for example, with breast cancer, it's likely in some way connected to raising levels of oestrogen. And in uh, mouth and throat cancers, we know that alcohol is broken down into other cancer-causing chemicals that can directly damage the DNA. But there's still a lot to unravel. Sarah Williams from Cancer Research UK. Thank you for listening to this edition of NewsHour. News Hour has been a download from the BBC. To discover more and our terms of use, visit bbc.com/podcasts.